All right. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are looking at retirement goals and how does renting and buying a home offer potentially a faster track to your retirement goals? Um, this is a personal question of mine because I want to leverage my ability to um, to play with those fixed costs at any point. And housing is one of our biggest costs that we'll ever have in our life. So um, this is a great way to kind of look at that with a fresh perspective. So we're going to look at the long-term financial impact of housing costs, whether we're buying or we're renting. So there's a lot of reasons to buy versus rent. Um, most people think about equity building, like our home is appreciating in value. This is a quasi investment as most people think of it. I know as I thought of it when I bought this home that I'm in right now um, in a really booming small little mountain town in the Pacific Northwest. There's also stability. I don't have to move every year. I have a young family. That's really nice to know we're not packing up um, investment potential personalization. I can paint the rooms. I can do whatever I want with it. Um, there's some tax benefits. I get to deduct you know, interest and insurance and things like that from my mortgage, from my taxes. There's this pride of ownership. This is more of kind of like that American ideal that like you want to own a home. And some People want that. You know, they want to be able to claim that. And then again, just control over our personal space. I could knock this home down if I wanted to and build, a, you know, my dream house if I really, really wanted to. But there's also benefits to renting. And this includes flexibility. You can move really easily when you're renting. Or move to another location without having to look in, you know, find realtors, find lenders, find a home, make it work. Um, you can just find rentals and move right into them. And in fact, you can more flexible to move every year, whereas selling my home, there's a lot of costs that go into that. Um, there's also lower upfront costs, undeniable. You're not paying for closing fees, for um, down payments, anything. You're not responsible for maintenance. This may be the number one reason that most people rent. Um, they just don't want to deal with any of that. Their landlord does it. The owner does it. Um, a variety of locations. You can, especially if you're one of these digital nomads these days, like myself, I suppose. I'm not so nomadic, but I'm quite digital. Um, um, you're able to to choose where you want to live. Um, you have limited financial risk. You're not at the whim of the market as much. Your rents will increase and decrease depending on the market. So it's limited, but there is still some. And then sometimes shared amenities if you're in a larger complex. But let's break down the actual numbers of how this works out. So if you are looking to buy a new home, let's say, for instance, that you're going to purchase a home for 500000 and you're going to put $100,000 down. That's 20%. Now, you could argue that you could do this at a lower amount, um, get a first-time homeowners, put down less. But we want to lower our mortgage payments, and we want to reduce our PMI, that little fee that gets tacked on when your equity is not as high or when your equity in the home is lower than 20%, um, and for different reasons. So we're going to use these numbers. We have a 5.65 interest rate, which is common right now, 30-year term. That makes our monthly costs about $2,300 to own this home. Now, we're going to look at also the additional costs to owning a home because I am responsible for the insurance, the taxes, the maintenance. So I'm using these really averaged fees, uh, percentages of the current home value. So that's going to increase as my home appreciates in value over time. Um, again, these can wildly fluctuate depending on what state you're living in. Um, so these are just basic averages with uh, a little bit more conservative approach to that. So this is what the cost to own a home looks like. And this is just, I just want you to take the visual of this. You can see that my mortgage payments, they stay the same. And this is often one of our biggest reasons to be buying a home. We say, this is a fixed payment forever and ever. It's only going to be $2,300. But what we often don't talk about is the rest of our payments are still going to escalate as our home appreciates in value. As it gets older, it's probably going to require more maintenance and repairs. So as we go down, you can see that the cost does increase quite a bit to own a home. And we're going to look at 13, I show 15 years here, but we're going to look at 13 years because that's the average amount of time that um, homeowners are staying in their home right now these days. So if we compare that to a rental, let's say we have the same monthly rental rate, 2300, and we're going to use a 5% rental rate annual increase. Again, that's a very average rate. Um, so here, you know, it is arguable, right, that renting is more affordable than homeownership. Of course, right? We're paying less in maintenance and insurance and taxes. Those are all being paid by our landlord. But what's not being shown here is that wonderful 
or what, you know, this is where that, that extra money is coming from, right? You're spending money on maintenance and repairs throughout the life of your home um, to be able to do that. But what's not in that chart is when you go to sell your primary residence. And I think most of us have this as our reason for owning this primary home um, as opposed to renting. You know, it is going to appreciate over time. It is going to sell. We're going to make that profit later on, right? Appreciation is a strong force that we love in real estate investing. It allows us to get incredible returns on our money. Um, and so why not the same for our primary residence? It'll be awesome when we go to have that after 13 years of equity building. So if we look at a 7% appreciation rate, this is actually quite high. Um, we tend to think of appreciation rates at around 3%, but it's escalated quite a bit in the recent years um, up higher. But this is still a little bit of a high number, and I am purposefully using this high number because I wanted these numbers to break even. So know that I looked at all of these scenarios and I said, oh, at a 3% appreciation rate, at a 7%, at a 5%, um, we were losing a lot more money. So this is forced into just trying to break even nearly. This means that if we sell in 13 years, we're going to sell for $1.1 $1 .1 that's amazing. So some sales cost, right? Closing costs, realtor fees, you're paying back your loan. You've actually only paid about $90,000 of your uh, principal payment down due to that amortization schedule. Um, but in the end, Wahoo, we've made over $730,000 profit on the home. And most people would look at this and be really excited about that in year 13 and say, I have an extra $734,000 right now, 13 years later. But what we don't often think about is that you also paid $729,000 to own that home. This means that your actual profit is a little bit more than $4,500. And this is not something that we think about in as much. Um, I certainly don't think about when I looked at these numbers, I was a little bit shocked because um, it just seems like there has got to be more appreciation there or benefits to owning the home, financially speaking, right? Um, again, you we think about the time value of money. If I was spending that $729 throughout the life of that investment, I, what could have I been doing with the extra money in the meantime? So <laughs> That's how I felt when I when I looked at these numbers a little bit. Uh, but what if we were to rent and invest the difference? And this is where it becomes really neat to see, like, what are our decisions about money right now, today, and what we're spending money on versus what we're investing in? How is that going to impact our future selves? Um, because I find that it's very hard to really think about what's going to happen down the road um, without seeing sort of the scenario played out in front of me. So again, this is the same chart we showed we showed before. The home ownership is a little bit more expensive over the course. I'm not showing the down payment because that kind of skews this whole chart up quite a bit higher because that's an extra hundred thousand dollars. So we're looking at investing the difference here because we have to rent a home. So we're going to pay the same twenty three hundred dollars a month to be able to rent the home. That's going to look more like this because you have that hundred thousand dollars bulk. Um, down payment in year one that you can also add to it. But we're basically going to be investing an annual amount of about $10,600. And that's the average of that additional cost spread out over 13 years. So if I were to invest just $10,600 annually that I would have been spending on insurance and taxes and maintenance of owning this home, um, what would that look like for my future? So I looked at this in both stocks and passive real estate investing, and I'm using a 7% annual cash flow and a 1.8 equity multiple. And if you're familiar with Good Egg, you know what these numbers mean. Um, but And then that 7% annual return of the stock portfolio, um, which is a common number after inflation that most people cite as um, as the, the return that we get over time. Now, at 13 years, if you had rented a home over that course of period with your rent escalating, you know, it's going to cost more every year to, to own, to live anywhere, you would have a portfolio, a net worth of $415,000 if you had put that money in the stock market as you go. That is compared to your profit of $4,000, right? And so you are, you could actually be building a lot more of your long-term wealth as you go. And this is what um, you know, the financial thought leaders in this space, this is Ramit Sethi. He's got great things to say about what it means to be rich. Um, 
and and he's helped a lot of people start investing and saving. He would point to these stocks like, look, this is the number that you could be saving. Same with Katie Gaddy Tawson. She is the host of the Money with Katie show. It's one of my funniest, sassiest podcasts that I have in my feed. Um, again, they're going to point to these numbers. These two both rent, I believe. They don't. They're multi-million dollar you know business owners, and they don't own their own homes as just examples. But what about that number, right? And if you're savvy, you're looking at this and saying, that's much bigger. If I invested in passive real estate investing, my total net worth would be over $700,000. Now that's not all liquid because some of it's tied up in the assets, but a lot of it is liquid. And we're going to look at that. This is what Annie and Julie here with Good Egg Investments have been sort of like standing in the background of life, like waving their hands, like, hello, you can also do this. Like, this is why they built this company to be able to share this opportunity with more people because people are investing in passive real estate. They're building their wealth and we're trying to bring it to more people and show that this is like an incredible way to, to, to build lasting wealth and build it quicker. So I want to dive into this in another scenario a little bit more to just really compare this stock versus passive real estate investing and how that could impact your housing costs. So let's say we do that and we rent for 13 years and we invest the funds in passive real estate. These are our liquid funds available. Now we're reinvesting them every year up until year 13 because we want to grow our portfolio. But what if in year 14, I decide to withdraw my annual rent amount? This is about $50,000 by year 14. So every year I'm going to withdraw a little bit more because my rent is going to increase of my annual rent from my liquid funds available. You can see that between this year here and the year where my arrow is pointing to, it's gone down a little bit because that those are the monies that I'm pulling out of it, the liquid funds available. This can be from that 7% annual cash flow. Sometimes that number fluctuates, but it's also from the proceeds of the sales of these assets that are now coming due because we have a five-year hold period on most of these. Now you can see that I'm everything is kind of still going in the upwards direction. If we pull that out to 30 years, I can continue to pull all of my living expenses, all of my rental, I should say. Maybe I want to buy a new couch every once in a while. And that might be your living expenses too. But our portfolio is going to continue to grow. And if you add just the total net worth in there, you can see that it's quite a bit more because the liquid funds available don't account for the equity you have inside those um, those properties in, in passive real estate investing. And I'm talking about multifamily properties, apartment buildings, hotels, these bigger commercial assets. So you're investing in the business behind these um, commercial assets. Now, this is the sad news of the stock portfolio. So if I did the same thing and I started withdrawing my annual rent in year 14, my stock portfolio would plummet. It is not at all able to withstand that amount of withdrawal. And in fact, and just a few years later, I would withdraw it down to zero. Um, so the, the growth there is just drastically, drastically different. Um, and I, I think that, you know, this is showing the flexibility of having the cash flow and the proceeds be coming to you in those staggered years, but increasing years over time. You've got money that's growing inside hard assets with passive real estate investing. Um, and you can really start to get creative even with your housing costs with these. Um, so I bring all of this up because we do have deals right now that are um, actually better than what I've just shown you. I'm using a really conservative 1.8 equity multiple to show all of these numbers. Our Good Egg Growth Fund right now, three, as well as the Good Egg Wealth Fund, two, um, is showing a projected returns of almost 2x equity multiple, which means that you're going to increase that graph really, really quickly. And the best part is that we can now do this $10,000 minimum. So this is why most people don't know about passive real estate investing, because in the past, you had to have $50,000 to be able to invest in passive real estate um, at, a, at a time due to just like hefty regulations to protect the investor on these on these sites. But now these days, you can do the $10,000 minimum, which is really helpful um, for newer investors to be able to leverage this type of wealth building earlier on in their trajectories. Um, these are some of my data sources. Again, I'm happy to share anything with you. A lot of just like tax property calculators increases, but some, a lot of this research that was done by Money with Katie and as well as the numbers that were presented in Quit Like a Millionaire by Christy Shen. And they pulled together a lot of this analysis to be able to really critique this. And I just added my own flair to it um, with some updated, updated numbers. 
Well, I, Mahesh, I just saw that you joined us just now. I'm almost all the way through the presentation, but you should catch the replay. It was a quick one today. Um, I went through it probably a really fast, but um, really illuminating. It's definitely made me consider, well, should I start renting this house out and rent properties um, instead to be able to invest the difference and grow my wealth a little bit quicker? Um, right now, our Good Egg Growth Fund 3 is still open. Again, that's the 7% preferred return. Those equity multiples range from 1.7 to 1.9x. The numbers for that property actually look more like this, which are a little bit higher. Um, this is the Crown Club apartment building in Winston-Salem that the growth fund will be di invested directly into. You can also do the wealth fund, which will also be invested in that Crown Club property, but also our Encore Metro property, which is under operation, which is hitting all of our projections and then some, which is really exciting in this market. Um, you do have to be an accredited investor to invest in the Good Egg Wealth Fund at a $50,000 minimum, but class A and B multifamily, five-year hold time, really similar parameters. And this is a little bit more about us at Good Egg Investments. Julie and Annie started this company. We're now a small but mighty team, about five or six people. And um, our goal is to continue to offer these investments to retail investors. It would be really easy for us to shop out large capital, large private funding groups. And certainly sometimes they come in to help us be able to purchase a bigger deal. But it's always with the goal of getting more and more retail investors like you and I into this team of ownership so that we can use this type of wealth building in our personal journeys. It's not just locked up to the people in the know, in other words. Pretty easy to invest. Head over to goodegginvestments.com slash deals and you can look at all of this, the summaries. You can always reach out to us too. We're happy to jump on a call. You can email Jason Kleiman here. He's usually here with me, um, but couldn't make it today. He's investor relations at goodegginvestments.com. I'm Susan at goodegginvestments.com. Again, reach out anytime. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next Good Egg Live next week. Thanks everybody for joining.